and I will, I'm about to text you, Karen, the first speaker. Okay. Great. So I'm sharing the intro slide and the live stream has started. Good afternoon or good morning, depending upon where you're joining us from. Welcome to the revised Letting Copper Rule public listening session. My name is Karen Wirth and I'll be facilitating today's session. If you haven't already done so, we invite you to view the administrator, EPA administrator's video message on the importance of these engagements to the agency. It can be found at www.epa.gov slash safe water. We also encourage you to watch the Lead and Copper Rule 101 video, which can also be found at the same website, www.epa.gov slash safe water. This session is being recorded and live streamed on YouTube. Before we begin, I'd like to introduce representatives from EPA who are here today to listen to your comments. For this session today, we are joined by Joe Tiago, Crystal Rogers Jenkins, and Eric Bernison. So I'll go ahead and hand it over to you, Joe. Thank you, Karen, for the introduction. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Joe Tiago, and I currently serve as the Special Project Advisor for Principal Deputy Assist uh, Assistant Administrator Radical Fox in the Office of Water at the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency. And in my role, I provide advice and guidance to the principal deputy assistant administrator on policy and, and regulatory issues. Uh, thank you for being here today. And hello, um, I am Crystal Rogers Jenkins. I'm the deputy director of the Standards and Risk Management Division within the Office of Groundwater and Drinking Water um, at EPA. So I'm part of the session today because lead and copper rule revisions are managed out of uh, my division. And in my role, I provide oversight and management of this project as far as resources are concerned. Thank you. Hello, I'm Eric Bernison, and I'm the director of the uh, Office of Groundwater Drinking Water Standards and Risk Management Division, uh, the same division uh, that Crystal just mentioned. Uh, this division has oversight of the review of the lead and copper rule revisions. I wanna thank you all for joining us today. I look forward to hearing your input. It'll be very valuable to us as we evaluate, uh, review the rule and evaluate if any additional revisions are appropriate. Joe? So thank you, uh, everyone. Today we are here to listen to you and hear about how lead has impacted your community. Uh, your input will help EPA as we review the lead and copper rule revisions and work to ensure that we are doing our best to protect public health, especially for those that are most at risk in, and impacted by, by lead in drinking water. Thank you for being here today and I look forward to hearing your thoughts and concerns. Karen, you may be on mute. Thank you, Joe. Thank you, Joe, Crystal, and Eric for being here and being our listeners today. We really appreciate your time. So now I'm gonna go over a few of our ground rules. Each participant is allotted three minutes to make their comments. Your adherence to this time allocation will allow all participants an equal opportunity to provide their comments. While it is your, when it's your scheduled time, I will call your name and invite you to unmute your microphone and you will be give, begin your statement. At that time, please make sure to unmute your microphone, both on your cam on your computer as well as on Zoom, or if you're on or unmuting yourself on your phone, if that's how you're joining us today. Uh, if I cannot hear you, I will let you know. And if possible, please consider turning on your camera if you're comfortable doing so. When you have a minute left, I will turn my camera back on. So you should begin to wrap up your statement at that time. I will give you a verbal warning at 30 seconds and we'll hold up this red card when your time is up. And at that time, we will mute, mute your microphone. 
If you are joining us by telephone, I will give you a verbal warning at 30 seconds. And when your time is up, uh, I will also give you a verbal warning. Uh, again, to ensure everyone signed up today for this session is able to speak, we ask that you keep your uh, comments within your time limit and keep your comments focused on lead in drinking water and the revised lead in coffee rule. We thank you for your interest and we look forward to hearing from, your, from you today and hearing your input. Uh, our first speaker uh, will be Queen Shabazz, Shabazz, who's joining us from Virginia. Queen, please go ahead with your statements. Yes, good Wednesday, everyone. Thank you so much, Karen. I'm Queen Zakia Shabazz, mother of a lead poisoned son, founder of United Parents Against Lead. On behalf of lead poisoned children and their families, and on behalf of all those that are potentially at risk of being poisoned by their drinking water, I submitted that, that it is time for the Environment Protection Agency to recognize that water is a human right. Access to clean, safe drinking water is a human right. In the interest of safety and environmental protections, it is paramount that EPA issue a much more health protective rule. While we are pleased to see an update of the 30 year old lead and copper rule, the January 21 rule still leaves a lot to be desired. For instance, the rule lacks urgency and allows the most lead contaminated water systems more than 33 years to replace their lead service lines, while some systems would never have to remove their lead pipes at all. This condemns millions of Americans to drink, cook with, and bathe in lead contaminated water for many generations to come. This, pro this poses special risks to children. As a member of the Lead Service Line Replacement Collaborative, our actions are consistent with 100% removal of all lead service lines. Complete and immediate removal of lead lines will reduce the disproportionate burden of lead poisoning in communities of color and low income communities and will decrease the risk of mass poisoning and death as that occurred in Flint, Michigan. Remember two year old Sincere and the thousands of Flint children who are still suffering from the lingering effects of lead poisoning. Remember that harm, damage done by lead persists a lifetime. EPA should mandate full replacement of all lead service lines within 10 years and strengthen corrosion control efforts requirements. EPA should also improve the rules public education components to avoid under detection and under reporting of lead contamination and to ensure that the public understands the health risks and what they and water utilities can do to minimize them. There are no safe levels of lead, yet our children drink lead tainted water every day at school. I know because I was fired from my first grade teaching position at Richmond Public Schools after UPAL tested and found lead in drinking water fountains at two elementary schools. So EPA should also fix the flawed school and childcare lead provisions. These provisions require testing of only five outlets in each school and just two in childcare centers once every five years with no mandatory retesting. This equates to childrenism, and UPAL defines childrenism as the systematic discrimination against children, gross negligence, gross derelictions of one's responsibility to children. There are no safe lead levels. EPA was established to protect the environment, and it's time the agency starts doing so and can do so through enforcing stricter requirements of the lead and copper rule. Thank you for hearing me this morning, this afternoon. <laughs> Thank you, Queen, for your statements. Uh, next up, uh, I'm going to, we'll welcome Ronnie Levin from Massachusetts to give us your comments. Please unmute yourself and begin your statements. In 1986, I wrote EPA's analysis of reducing lead in drinking water. I retired from EPA four years ago after almost 40 years. Since 1986, we've learned a lot. 
We learned that lead contamination of drinking water is way more common than we thought. That there are some surprises, but many more predictable patterns. There is no substitute for testing water at the tap. Paying for corrosion control treatment doesn't ensure that it works. If there's no monitoring and enforcement, not much happens. Lead service lines are way more pervasive than we thought, and if you don't get the lead pipes out, they will continue to contaminate the water forever. You can pay implementation and oversight costs and still avoid solving problems. On the other hand, some of what we knew in 1986 is still true. Using corrosion inhibitors reduces lead levels and reduces corrosion in both public and private plumbing. There didn't appear to be a threshold for lead health damage, and it doesn't look like there is. As lead exposures from other sources have declined, the relative contribution from drinking water has increased. In a water supply that meets the current LCR, 80% of lead exposure can be from drinking water. We've also learned that lead contamination problems can be symptoms of other problems like poorly maintained infrastructure and housing. We know that an a complicated and unenforceable LCR does not protect public health. EPA needs to simplify the LCR, set clear and enforceable standards, enlist the states as honest brokers, prohibit gaming like deleting outliers and sampling out, needs to set a too high level that delivered tap water cannot exceed establish a single enforcement reporting system for EPA and the states and enforce the LCR. It may be that it's time to reestablish an enforceable MCL for lead, but one at the tap and that is protective of Americans. The timing is crucial. After 40 years of declining lead exposures in the US, Data from the CDC show that US pediatric blood lead levels began to increase in 2014. We know what to do. And EPA needs to resume its premier position as the protector of US health and the environment. Thank you. Thank you, Ronnie, for your statement. Uh, we are still awaiting some of our other speakers to join us. So at this time, uh, we are going to take a short break, about 15 minutes to allow some of our other speakers to join us. So we're gonna take a bit of a pause and uh, we'll invite you back in about 15 minutes. Thank you.
Thank you all for your patience. We're just awaiting some of our other speakers who have signed up to speak with us today to join us. So we'll be reconvening um, at uh, around one o'clock. So uh, thanks again for your patience and please stand by. Thanks.
Thank you all for your patience. I just wanna let you know that we're on a slight break right now, awaiting some of our other speakers to join us. So we will get back started around one o'clock. So please stand by. Thanks again for your patience.
Thanks everyone again for your patience. I'd like to invite our listeners to join us. Great, thank you everyone again for your patience. I know we have some of our speakers that are struggling on Zoom. I know we've all been at this virtual uh, platform for over a year now, but many of us still struggle to, to uh, get on sometimes. So thank you so much for your patience. We do have people uh, working in the background to make sure we get everybody logged on today. So again, thank you so much for your patience and working with us. Um, I just wanted to uh, remind folks who are, are just joining us, each of our speakers will be allotted three minutes to make their comments. Um, please stick within that time. Uh, when you have one minute left, I will turn my camera back on so you should begin to wrap up your statement and I'll give you a verbal warning at 30 seconds and at which time uh, when your time is running out, uh, I will hold this card up to indicate that your, your time is up. So I ask that you please wrap up your statements as we will mute your microphone. So with that, um, again, thank you for your patience. And uh, I invite uh, Sarah Cam, from, uh, who's joining us from New York, to please uh, unmute your line. Uh, we've unmuted you on our end. So please go ahead with your statements. You have three minutes. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Sarah Cam, and I'm pleased to testify on behalf of New York State Attorney General Letitia James. We urge EPA to expeditiously remedy the deficiencies in the revised lead and copper rule by adopting a rule that uses the best available science, protects the health of all Americans, and rectifies the environmental injustice in access to safe drinking water. As EPA acknowledged, the impact of lead exposure, including through drinking water, is a public health issue of paramount importance. No amount of lead is safe for consumption. The dangers of lead in drinking water have gone unaddressed for far too long. Since the late 1800s, the United States has recognized that lead surface lines carrying drinking water caused lead poisoning. By the 1920s, many cities and towns began restricting the use of lead service lines. However, the lead industry carried out a concerted campaign to promote the use of lead service lines and other products containing lead despite the known dangers. As a result, drinking water remains a significant source of lead exposure. EPA must take strong and decisive action to reduce lead exposure in drinking water. Lead service line replacement is the most effective method to do so. In 1991, EPA called for replacement of lead service lines within 15 years. At that time, EPA expressly rejected calls for a 50-year replacement schedule because accelerated replacement was necessary to protect public health. But lead service lines were never replaced as EPA directed. 30 years after EPA called for accelerated replacement and 15 years after replacement should have been completed, lead in drinking water continues to threaten communities across the country. Because of various inequities, lead in drinking water disproportionately affects lower income and minority populations. COVID-19 also confined people to their homes where lead exposure for these populations can be particularly high. The pandemic also delayed lead removal efforts and disrupted routine childhood lead screenings, leaving many children without access to essential interventions. In the revised lead and copper rule, EPA delayed replacement of lead service lines to 33 years after exceedance of the action level. In addition, the lead service line replacement provision depends on the ability of home and other building owners to pay to replace private water lines, which is likely to exacerbate the baseline health risk disparity among low income and minority populations. Now is the time for EPA to finally protect public health from lead in drinking water. EPA cannot allow another Flint or Newark drinking water crisis to occur. We call for EPA to reduce the action level, increase lead service line replacement, protect children from lead contamination in schools and childcare facilities, and rectify the environmental injustice in access to safe drinking water. Thank you for the opportunity to speak today. Thank you for your comments, Sarah. Uh, and again, we are um, having some people having some technical difficulty getting on Zoom. Uh, so we're gonna take another short pause. Thank you so much for your patience. We, it is very important to us that we make sure we help people get on uh, and hear from them. So uh, we'll be uh, taking another 15 minute break. Thank you so much.
Thank you all for your patience. Uh, we are um, currently on a break. I really appreciate you waiting. Uh, we are 
engaging some of our speakers who have not showed up today to make sure that uh, we can hear from them if they would like to have some time to speak. So uh, thank you for your patience and we will be reconvening at 1.20. Uh, again, thanks so much and please stand by. Thank you.
Thank you. Thank you all again so much for your patience. I'd like to invite our listeners to join us back on the line. Uh, thanks. Uh, I, I just uh, thank you again, everybody, for your patience. We've had a number of cancellations, um, and so we are uh, awaiting a few speakers to join us. So thank you again for your patience. Um, so I want to remind everybody that we'll have three minutes allotted for your comments. Uh, your adherence to that time is greatly appreciated. When you're scheduled, when you have one minute left, I will turn my camera back on and that should indicate to you that you should begin to wrap up your statements. Uh, I'll also give you a verbal warning at 30 seconds. And at um, when your time is up, I'll, I will hold up this red card to be a visual indicator that your time is up. Uh, so with that, um, I will welcome uh, Garth Saulfield. I hope I pronounced that properly. Uh, joining us today from California. Garth, uh, you can go ahead and unmute yourself and begin your statements. Good morning from the West Coast. This has been quite a uh, educational experience for me as I imagine it is for most of us. Uh, currently, my community is not affected by lead pipes as, as far as I know anyways. Uh, however, I am 73 years old. I am affected by peripheral neuropathy. So it's quite possible that sometime during my lifetime, I have had a lead pipe situation in my life, uh, that being a nerve issue. Uh, as I have learned about this lead pipe uh, situation, and uh, you know, when I first heard about this talking or uh, listening, the EPA uh, lead pipe, lead copper rule revision. I, I first, my first reaction was, what? Why are we even talking about this? Why, you know, it should, it should be a no brainer. There shouldn't be any lead in our pipes. And uh, I mean, that's still my position. We, as a nation, we cannot afford to have lead in anybody's pipe. Uh, that, our children, our elders, nobody should, we can't afford to have citizens to be drinking with lead or bathing or have, we can't afford to have lead in people's pipes. It just, um, it makes no sense. We can't be damaging our citizens in such a way. The, uh, the, the effect of uh, the cost to our citizens, the cost to our, uh, communities is just astronomical. I can't imagine that we could even envision continuing with a situation like that. So no matter the cost of what it takes to fix this situation, we need to do it now. At least that's my position. Uh, we cannot continue on with lead in our pipes. So thank you so much for this opportunity to speak. I appreciate that. And uh, hopefully we'll have lots more folks speak up. And uh, I say it's been a huge learning opportunity. I didn't expect to learn this much myself. So thank you. Carry on. <laughs> thank you, Garth, so much for your, for your statements. Um, and thank you for, for joining us today. Uh, next up, we will hear from James Mosley. And James is joining us from Indiana. James, go ahead and unmute yourself and please begin your statements. Can James, you hear me? We sure can. Thank you so much. Okay. Please go ahead. Okay. Okay, good. Listen, I just want to say thank you for uh, <clears throat> putting on these listening sessions. <clears throat> Excuse me. I'm uh, uh, calling from Evansville, Indiana. We we're right here on the Ohio River. And uh, we have, uh, being on the river, we have some of the oldest housing stock in the state of Indiana. Uh, we are also currently a Superfund site. You may have heard of just Jacobsville 
where they are actually remediating lead in, uh, and uh, arsenic in the soils as a result of it uh, being contaminated from manufacturing and smelting processes that were going on here. But we have uh, 70% of our houses um, that predates 1978, which is you know when the, the lead was removed from paint. Uh, however, we are on the Ohio River, and so there uh, has been air, uh, water, uh, uh, and soil concerns here. Um, the, the housing stock is very old, and uh, they are actually the, the Evansville Water and Soil Utility is in the process of replacing. In fact, they're getting ready to propose a rate increase that they would uh, might uh, replace those uh, lead lines once they've identified them and replace those lead lines uh, again from at least from the street to the property property line and then of course I believe it's on the property owner to replace uh, from their property line to the home. Um, we uh, have we have not had uh, concerns with re that has at least been documented. We all know uh, the concerns from lead exposures are well uh, documented. Kidney learning. Uh, uh, disabilities, uh, nervous conditions, and, and other uh, types of uh, impacts from being uh, exposed to lead. Uh, there has not been any uh, reports uh, in terms of documenting the water quality here, but I suspect we will soon find out as they undertake, this, as the city undertake that initiative to replace the water lines here. And, and so they're, 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 they're getting ready to propose a rate increase uh, so that they can, in fact, uh, replace those water lines. And, and so my, my, my question it becomes, and, and as, as, as you have some populations that are on fixed income or low income uh, populations, uh, particularly maybe environmental justice uh, areas of uh, minority, low income uh, populations, where they may be disproportionately impacted uh, economically or and or uh, how it may Im impact those uh, communities to ensure that they're they're being tested uh, or if they would undertake some type of a pilot project to ensure those communities are in fact not being left out uh, they typically uh, live in the older housing stock areas of town and um, where sometimes the uh, the, the housing uh, uh, may may have uh, 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 you know, the, the landlords may not keep uh, the housing conditions and pipes up up to 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 speed, and so that's one concern I would have as it come out as as this new rule is being the lead and copper rule is being rolled out to ensure that these low income and environmental justice populations or underserved uh, communities. Are, are are being addressed. I don't know if there's any particular uh, specific um, uh, policies to ensure that, uh, you know, that I mean, every, everyone's you here, you hear Flint, Michigan. And so, you know, what comes comes to mind nationally, uh, certainly, I, I don't think we have that kind of con situation here, but certainly we want to ensure that those uh, environmental justice populations are, are being addressed. Um, and again, this is a proposed rate increase. So we look forward to making sure that there is going to be equitable uh, representation as they undertake those that testing here. Uh, but I, I think this is just great, these listening sessions. And I probably didn't contribute a lot to it because I'm more familiar with lead-based paint exposure. You know, and 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 those kinds of hazards and risk reduction activities uh, that that relates to exposure to lead-based paint, and we 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 have again some of the oldest housing stock in the state of Indiana. So that's a concern here, and children being tested, and and uh, uh, from uh, from from low-income uh, communities to ensure that their, their exposure rates are being accurately recorded. Uh, is one of the concerns that I, I, I would speak to. However, uh, the water quality is equally as important given the age of the housing stock here. So I'm just really glad to see that the EPA is back in the saddle again um, uh, and uh, will uh, we'll, we'll start enforcing and renewing and upgra uh, upgrading their policies relative to that. Uh, certainly, uh, 
I want to congratulate and welcome the new EPA director. Uh, I lived in D.C. for 13 years. I had an opportunity to meet Dr. Clarice Gaylord, who was actually the first uh, administrator for the Office of Environmental Justice uh, by uh, W.H. Uh, uh, um, um, Bush, President W.H. Uh, Bush. Uh, actually hired Dr. Clarice Gaylord to direct the Office of Environmental Justice. I had the opportunity to meet with her when I was living in D.C. And and so that that was certainly an, an honor. And we looked at, uh, while working at the Environmental Regulations Administration, we looked at uh, the uh, the Anacostia River, which at that time was endangered, was was a, a, a spec, uh, was a, um uh, was known known as the number one endangered river in the country, and so we were looking at uh, in our own backyard there for some of the water quality concerns associated with that. Uh, but uh, to the extent that uh, the James, US you have, EPA, you have 30, James, you have thirty seconds for your statement. Okay, and, and so good. <laughs> and I hope I wasn't rambling. But again, thank you for these these sessions. Uh, we did get an EPA environmental justice grant here in Evansville at Carver Community Organization, and we're looking to re-engage and educate the residents here on uh, lead concerns and toxins and other uh, protect protect uh, kids and uh, the community from that. So we look forward to hopefully being able to engage that with uh, and apply and uh, for resources that can help us roll that out in our communities here in Evansville. And, so again, keep keep up the good work. Thank you for having me online uh, for this, and we appreciate uh, your 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 efforts there. Thank you. Thank you so much for your comments, James. Uh, we really appreciate it. Um, we've had a number of uh, speaker cancellations. Um, so James was our last speaker today. So I would like to thank everybody very much for your participation, and I'd like to turn it over to our listeners for some closing remarks. Uh, why don't I hand it over to you, Joe? Thank you, Karen. And, and thank you to everyone that participated in today's listening session. Uh, EPA truly appreciates the time you have taken today to join us and, and provide input on the important issues surrounding lead in drinking water. We invite you to submit additional comments to the docket at regulations.gov. And we look forward to considering your, your input as we uh, move forward on this substantial issue. Thank you. I'll just add my thanks. Thanks for everybody for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you so much again to our listeners. Um, and I'd also like to remind participants and members to submit your written comments, as Joe mentioned, to the docket at uh, regulations.gov. Um, and our next listening session will begin at, um, I believe, three o'clock today. And uh, folks, please correct me if I'm wrong. I think three o'clock is right. Right. Thanks, Eric. Um, and if you're interested in viewing that session, uh, you may watch the live stream uh, following the instructions that are posted on epa.gov slash safe water. Um, and th so that concludes our uh, this particular LCRR listening session. And I again like to thank all of you for joining us. And uh, if you'd like to view past sessions, uh, you can also get access to those on epa.gov slash safe water for for information. So uh, thank you again for joining us and we appreciate your comments.